help, advises us when we need advice and supports us at, at all times. I, two years ago at graduation, I was walking away from graduation after Bishop Darcy had uh, given his, his usual uh, stellar performance at our graduation ceremony. The campus was uh, filled with big parties and fancy tables, and over in one corner of the campus, there was a kind of ragtag party, actually. It was the Notre Dame Right to Life group, but in the middle of the ragtag party uh, was Bishop John Darcy helping them uh, celebrate. Uh, he's always there when we need him. I uh, would like to ask him to introduce uh, our speaker this evening, Bishop Darcy. Thank you very much, uh, David. It, it, I, <clears throat> I have a 45-minute introduction here. No. <laughs> but, um, David, I, I just, uh, to see the enthusiasm of everyone, but especially the young people, uh, undergrads, and um, uh, for, for, the, for this seminar uh, uh, on um, the, the topic that's uh, so critical, the culture of life, the second of three, last year the culture of death, this year the culture of life, and next year there's something that follows from, from, from that. <laughs> well, what, is, what is the next year? From death to life. Okay, Ag agendas for the future. How many coming back for that? Anyway. <laughs> so uh, you, you should be uh, con congratulated, uh, Dave, and... Uh, for, for, for such an, an, I don't know what that young one, young woman meant when she said, uh, "I'm in big trouble." I mean, uh, but everybody that works with you seemed to understand what it meant. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think when you're in big trouble, it means you're helping a lot of people, and uh, so we commend you for that and, and, and thank you for putting this together. I want to greet also my good friend John Cavadini, uh, chairman of the theology department, and his wife Nancy, with whom I was with the other night because she assists the young college students, and I was privileged to give them an evening of recollection, the college students studying to, to be Holy Cross priests, and we had mass in the old chapel where Father Baden is buried, and it's a replica of the chapel that was here when Father Soren came. So this place is replete with lots of history. It's a, pr pr a pleasure to introduce the Cardinal. I'll just give you a few, a few little uh, things. Cardinal George is a member of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. This is a congregation that I am familiar with. I was a bishop, auxiliary bishop in Lowell, Mass., uh, the northern region of Boston, before coming here. 400 young men from that city and Old Mill City had become oblates. So I know them, uh, and I, I, uh, they were started around 1816 uh, by a bishop de Mazenod. In the Holy Father's talk uh, at the end of the Synod, a beautiful homily on the office of the bishop, he recounted a, a, a number of bishops who had been canonized in the last century. One was Bishop de Mazenod, who was the founder of the Oblates uh, in Aix de Provence in, in, uh, in uh, France. They were a missionary group giving missions and trying, the Cardinal told me beforehand, to strengthen the faith where, which had been so much damaged by the French Revolution and so forth, and trying to bring, bring it back. And parish missions, and in Marseille, where he was later bishop among the poorest people there, and in a very short time spread all over the world. And that, I think, is what is special, especially as he spoke of his religious family, uh, that he is an oblate of Mary Immaculate, the very term, an oblate, meaning you give your life and you, you, you offer your whole life to Mary for the church. The cardinal was ordained a priest in um, uh, 1963, I believe, and he was made a bishop, first in Yakima, then Archbishop of Portland, and then the pastor of the Great See of Chicago. But he was made a bishop in 1990. In that middle time, he seemed to use it fairly well. Uh, he was um, elected vicar general, number two man, as he said to me, you have the, 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 the superior general of the Oblates, and then you have the vicar general who does all the work. But uh, and is an administrative position, but also traveled a great deal. And what a wonderful preparation for his life later to have been so many places, mission places around the world, even Bill to Australia. So uh, um, also during that time, because he wasn't very busy, 
he, 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 received, he obtained a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Tulane while he was teaching in the seminary. And later, while he was um, vicar general of the whole congregation, he obtained a, a doctorate in theology at the Urbianum. And I won't tell them, I can't remember the name of the dissertation, but it had a lot to do with faith and culture. Uh, the, the, the Cardinal has played, although a bishop only 11 years, has played a significant role, really, in our um, uh, conference. Uh, right now, it, it, I don't know how he gets all these wonderful jobs, but now he's uh, uh, involved in the Committee on the Liturgy and working on translations, and he clarified all that for us recently. But we have elected him to three synods. The, the three, I've never been to a synod. But anyway, he's been... <laughs> He's been elected to three. Uh, why? But I have enough to do at Notre Dame. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's uh, it's a um, one was on the consecrated life, and um, one was on uh, the, the one just concluded on the office of bishop, and the third, the remnants was the what? Senate for, Senate for America, of whom we later had a conference here at Notre Dame. So that shows the, uh, the um, appreciation and respect that his colleagues in the Conference of Bishops have for him. And uh, he also gives, but I won't ask him to do that, he also is very good at giving you an informal uh, reflection on the Synod, its pluses and minuses and, and uh, what, it, what, it's, what it's done. But he does that informally to the bishops. It's a great... Uh, the joy to present to, uh, to this wonderful group of scholars, uh, scholars as um, the great Walker Percy said to us once when he got the late Terry Medal, he said, I always dreamed of going to the place where there was a community of scholars under Our Lady. And so to this community of scholars under Our Lady, Cardinal George, the Archbishop of Chicago. Thank you. introduction by Bishop Darcy. I had uh, the great honor of introducing Bishop Darcy to a group during our recent um, meeting, the annual meeting of the bishops in Washington in November, because he was being honored because of his work with campus ministry. And of course, his connection to the University of Notre Dame uh, was part of that, although it started long before he came to Indiana, his connection with university life and uh, that continues now, so I'm honored to be with him and with all of you. The real reason I'm here, of course, is because about three months ago I got a letter that started, I am in deep trouble. <laughs> this, is <clears throat> this is an after-dinner speech, so you have to tell a few jokes. You've read, perhaps, or heard of the book Aging with Grace. Aging with Grace is a book that is written about the school sisters of Notre Dame who have participated and continue to participate in studies on aging and physiological studies as well. They, they, they agree that after their death, their brain can be taken from their body and, and uh, bisected and all. And it's really a, a remarkable act of generosity on their part to submit themselves, not after death only, but before death, to various inconveniences in order to be the subject of a scientific study that bears much promise for all of us. It's a typical act of generosity of consecrated women. But in that book, Aging with Grace, one uh, sister speaks of her meeting with the Holy Father a couple years of ba back. She had been part of his early morning mass and in the library after. Um, as he went down to greet people, one by one, he stopped and he said, what kind of sister are you? And she said, oh, Holy Father, I'm a school sister of Notre Dame. Now, the Pope is a little deaf in one ear, and English isn't his best language. And he responded, oh, you have a good football team. <laughs> if you analyze that sentence, there are at least two mistakes in that papal statement. <laughs> I, I 
am very glad to be at Notre Dame. <laughs> and very glad to be here for the close of this splendid conference on the culture of life, which is sponsored by uh, an institute that I've tried to encourage, but in fact haven't given uh, very much help to. So I'm glad that I can uh, be a little bit of help tonight, perhaps. If speech is, uh, speech in a particular language is the primary carrier of culture, and uh, this is the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, then uh, conferences such as this, where a lot of talks are heard and uh, important conversations take place, are of extreme uh, importance for all of us. And I would like to thank, therefore, all the participants, especially the speakers, the center itself, and the university itself. Universities are one place where the church thinks, not the only place, as I think Father Hesburgh said once, but nonetheless a very important place because universities, by the very fact of their title, are supposed to give us a much more universal vision, a much bigger vision of things, and to talk about first-order questions, particular concerns, that uh, will enable us to see where we're going. And I think the fact that the university hosts now a center for ethics and culture tells us something about where we are, not just as a Catholic people, but as human beings at the beginning of the third Christian millennium. There's a much more self-conscious approach to culture, even among people who wouldn't consider themselves anthropologists or philosophers, or certainly not theologians, we hear the word a lot more frequently. And in the church, we hear very frequently what was mentioned by Bishop Darcy, the uh, juxtaposition of the word culture with the word faith. We don't hear quite so often the juxtaposition church and state. All these uh, institute church-state relationships. But I think the reason why we've shifted from church-state studies, although that does go on and will continue to go on, to a greater emphasis on faith-culture studies is because the church in the Second Vatican Council changed the way in which she thinks about herself. For several hundred years, particularly as a result of the ecclesiology of Cardinal Bellarmine, the church spoke of herself primarily as a society, as a complete society, complete with all that she needed to fulfill her mission, which is similar then and the partner to a state, a nation state particularly, which is also complete, has everything that it needs in order to fulfill its mission. And so in a sense you had two societies claiming authority over the same people as believers and as citizens, and so for hundreds of years the church-state conversation was extraordinarily difficult. Sometimes it descended into turf wars, but it was made difficult because two societies were vying for the loyalty of the same people. Nonetheless, it was the rubric under which the church entered into the public conversation as a society talking to a society, a church-state conversation. In that perspective, the law became the object of conversation again and again. And the contrast was always between the laws of a country, who, which tell us what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to behave, and the laws of God, the moral laws, which also tell us what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to behave. And in the topic of conversation that is the center of the study in this conference and in the conference last year, namely human life and human death, the need to have the laws of a country and the moral laws come out, somehow come into some sort of agreement or else we live uh, as people torn apart, that conversation is the primary conversation when you approach the church as a society and you talk about church-state relationships. That uh, conversation is uh, continued still today in a different kind of sense of what laws are about and whether or not human beings are capable of knowing the truth of anything, including the moral law, 
in that sort of uh, skeptical framework, the church becomes not so much a source of truth as rather one more pressure group which organizes itself to change uh, laws which isn't acceptable, which aren't acceptable to us. In that situation, all positions are relativized. And in fact, um, what's most resented very often when the church comes into that conversation is not so much what we say, but that we say it with an absolute certitude that this is the truth. That claim to know something absolute in the realm of morality is far more outrageous today than any particular conclusion we might make about cloning or in vitro fertilization or abortion. So it is that claim which, however, was, I think, brought into question, the claim that uh, all truths, in morality at least, are relative, and never can we know anything absolute, which was, in a sense, brought into question um, by the events of September 11th. And yet, even there, there is an attempt to reshape the conversation again to prove that it is the claim to know something absolute in the realm of morality which is responsible for the events of September 11th. I have a very, very fine uh, director of the pro-life office in the Archdiocese of Chicago, Noro O'Callaghan, who is a very capable uh, conversationalist in that church-state dialogue because she has a law degree from Georgetown and uh, that's another Catholic university if you <laughs> anyway um, <clears throat> but when I asked her to uh, maybe arguably but anyway um, <laughs> but uh, I asked her to reflect a little bit from her point of view of uh, what we might expect after in that conversation on church state relationships and the conversation around laws pertaining to human life and death what do you think might come out as a result of the uh, terrorist attack on the 11th of September and uh, the next few paragraphs here are hers and I'd like to read them to you because she says it very well the nation watched in horror as symbols of our nation's power were turned against us airplanes as weapons skyscrapers turned into crushing heaps to bury thousands. The military might of the Pentagon slashed open. Thousands of people, thousands of families destroyed in an instant for reasons that no one has quite discerned even months later. And now the question becomes, is it possible to maintain moral skepticism in the face of such events? The moral relativism that has become the lingua franca for the church-state conversation. She continues, while it would be wrong to reduce this tragic event to a morality play, it is also true that the event laid out in just a few hours a stark and riveting display of unadorned evil and death in which the terrorists made no demands and offered no explanations for their mass murder alongside of fundamentally good and generous actions even to the point of sacrifice of one's own life. While September 11th meant many things, and we are still learning its painful cultural lessons regarding politics, economics and security issues, many people have also seen, perhaps for the first time, the starkness of good and evil, life and death, played out before their eyes. Moral indifference and skepticism tend to crumble when confronted by such profound realities. Although the promoters of relativism have tried to shore up their philosophy, one senses that they are trying to convince themselves as much as anyone else. Only a week after the event, the New York Times Magazine printed a series of reflections on the tragic events, including the following. Are they moral monsters? Though we are being judged, despite our grief and loss, we cannot really judge. We are steeped in relativism, as confined by our narrative as the murderers are confined in theirs. We witness the violent assault of one narrative system upon another, People deeply enclosed in their sanctified worldviews were carrying out what they experienced as a sacred command to annihilate the others. The other. That, of course, is the standard operating philosophy of the New York Times. But closer to home. Well, no, that's simply true. I don't think they. <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't mind my saying it. That's what they say. Closer to home, however, Dean Stanley Fish, who is the new dean uh, as of a year or so ago 
at uh, the University of Illinois in Chicago, the Dean of uh, Liberal Arts, and has been extraordinarily welcoming to a uh, Catholic chair at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Not because, and he's a very talented man and, and a good conversationalist and a friend, not because he thinks what I say or you say has any scintilla of truth, but because he doesn't have anything to say that's truth either and doesn't believe anybody can, and therefore you may as well have a chair of Catholic studies because in all these postmodern uh, narratives uh, that are bound, well, the Catholics have as much right to produce some kind of narrative as anybody else. And so we can take advantage of that opening. It's also an opening he kind of delights in because he knows that Catholicism is the bête noire of many of his liberal compatriots. And so he takes delight. You know, it's his way of épater la, la bourgeoisie. It's his way of, of, of putting into everybody's face this chair of, of all things Catholic studies. But nonetheless, when you push him, and here's what Nora says about him, a New York Times op-ed by Stanley Fish titled Condemnation Without Absolutes, he agreed with what I had just read before from the New York Times, stating that there can be no independent standard for determining which of many rival interpretations of an event is the true one. Therefore, it is pointless to state that we seek justice and truth in response to terrorism because the terrorists themselves claim to seek the same values and no one, no one is capable of judging whose view of justice or truth is correct. Instead, we should be honest and simply acknowledge that we are fighting for our preferred values not because they are true or good, but because we like them very much and we wish to defend them. If Fish is correct, we are apparently facing a test to see who prefers their values and narratives more. This is Nora now, not Fish. <clears throat> and who can mobilize more resources and sacrifices in support of these preferences. To state it is evil to intentionally kill thousands of defenseless human beings to make a political point, which is what I think most of us here would say, is to become a part of the problem because such statements are irrelevant, confusing, and belong to the narrative systems that permit terrorists to kill thousands. In that particular conversation, therefore, you all know what we're up against, and it's something that is going to be with us for some time, despite the events of September 11th. Nonetheless, there's another conversation that I want to bring to your attention that I started out talking about, because I think it gets beyond epistemological postmodernism and the clash of narratives and relativism in moral theology and what kind of laws we should live under in a country when uh, many of us claim that there are moral laws that are higher yet than our civil laws. It gets beyond that, beyond those church-state questions, to the more basic conversation about the relationship or dialogue between faith and culture. And it does that, and we do it because of our faith, because the church no longer thinks of herself primarily as a society, like the Kingdom of France, as Bellarmine said, although we are social, obviously, and there is an organization, and it is certainly visible, which is why Bellarmine created his ecclesiology to begin with, to insist that the church is not just invisible, as the reformers said, but is a visible social reality. Now, however, we have a more nuanced view because the church, while admitting that we are social, says that more fundamentally we are a communion. And so it is the ecclesiology of communion that comes from Vatican II that pushes us to talk about faith culture rather than about church state. And in that conversation, the theology of communion tells us that who we are as Catholic believers is part of a network of relationships that are born or created among men and women in their being able to share the gifts that Christ wants his people to enjoy. Relationships are often born, aren't they? When you give someone a gift, if you give a gift at Christmas, it's because there is a relationship and it reinforces the relationship. If you give a gift to someone who you didn't know before, a relationship is born, the reciprocity is demanded. Gifts are the foundation of relationships. The best relationships are founded upon the most important gifts, the gift of life, the gift of new life in Christ. So we are a part of a communion, which is a network of relationship that comes to be because Christ gives gifts that he wants us to share. And when we share them, 
They're from Christ, but we are then in relationship with one another. What are these gifts? Well, we know what they are. They're the gospel of Christ and interpreted in the teachings of the church. There are the sacraments, which are the actions of Christ, which make us holy. There is the apostolic governance, the basic elements of the church's structure as a community. When these are shared, then uh, we enjoy a life that makes us one. We enter into communion with one another through the sharing of Christ's gifts. And we also enter into an impulse to share these gifts as widely as possible. That's what the church's mission is all about. We can't hug the gifts to ourselves or we'll lose them because they're spiritual gifts. You have to give them away or you won't keep them very long. And so the church is always a missionary church, eager to share the gifts as universally as possible. If, in fact, then, the church-state conversation, while it goes on and is of extraordinary importance, you know that, is nonetheless underpinned and sometimes undercut by this dialogue between faith and culture, who are the carriers of that conversation and how do we approach it? The theologians tell us that there are two moments in it. One is called enculturating the gifts. That is where you take these spiritual gifts that transcend any culture and you put them in a new language and you shape them in different ways. And the other element is when you have to evangelize the culture because something in the culture resists receiving the gifts of Christ. Cultures have a demonic aspect just as we are all sinners. And so there are always those two moments in the conversation between faith and culture. But what it does, I think, is bring home to us that the institutions that we relied upon to carry the faith when our horizon was shaped by that church-state conversation, the hospitals, the universities, the schools, the, you, the parallel institutions, if you like, that we borrowed from the culture but which we shaped according to our own faith vision, while still of extraordinary importance, nonetheless, in some ways, are less important when culture comes into it because institutions don't shape a people's cultural sense so much as does their language, so much as does our sense of space and time. It's, in a sense, how we sense where we are and when we are that is more important in getting at who we are in terms of our culture than just by explicit attention to our ideas or even explicit attention to our actions, to our morality. All those are in a context of a space-time continuum in this life, which, when that changes, indicates there is a huge cultural shift going on. And that is why I would like to return to the events of September 11th, because I think, over the long run, as we live through this in the decades to come, we will see that something happened, I believe, there to alter our sense of space and to alter our sense of time. And when that happens, the culture shifts. Our space is no longer secure, as we imagined that it would be forever. Our time is no longer the same. You remember, I'm sure many of you, how we were told by one author about ten years ago that history itself, had come to an end with the end of the Cold War. This was simply to be a time now where we took the institutions of the dominant superpower and saw them become universal. There was a phrase by Henry Luce, who was the founder of Time magazine, as you know, which called uh, the time from 1917 on, the American century. Um, that was the year when we rejoined the world. You know, for many, many years, we secured our frontiers, our space, and we lived in time that we ourselves had determined, dating practically everything from the beginning of our own nation, and uh, confining history before that to medieval uh, and uh, ancient history that wasn't of particular importance. That American century, which began in 1917 when we rejoined the world, General Pershing returning to France saying, Lafayette, we are here, we've come back, 
We did come back, but on our own terms, and therefore it was an American century. That American century came to an end on September 11, 2001. And we are back into the historical process, not on our own terms. And we are a country among other countries, no longer secure behind our own borders. There are those who would say that this is a tragic event. And of course, September 11th was an extraordinarily tragic event. But I would like to argue that the end of the American century is not something that is to be regretted. And not something particularly that is to be regretted by those of us who share a universal faith. For the last decade of that century was, it seems to me, an exercise in massive self-indulgence. The great scandal of the year 2000 presidential campaign was that we went through months and months of political discourse and never, hardly ever at least, spoke about foreign policy. We allowed ourselves to indulge the illusion that it didn't matter what other people think of us, that we were in the world, but entirely on our own terms. And of course, if in fact all politics are local, as was our proudest boast at one time, and if that locus is the United States of America, then September 11th will be repeated again and again and again. If all politics are local, then the locus must be global. Nothing less than that. And for those of us in a universal church, that's not a bad place to be. Carl um, Bronner spoke about the uh, symbol of the Second Vatican Council, no matter what it did, but the coming together for the first time of bishops from every continent of the world in an ecumenical council as the birth of a world church. That's one way of saying we're a Catholic church, but he meant it phenomenologically. And I think that when we stop to look around and we recognize that the new era is truly global, we can say we've been there before. We were born in an empire that had pretensions to being universal, although we know now it wasn't. But the mindset of Catholic believers was always, we belong everywhere. James Joyce said that very well, when, even though he himself disliked the Catholic Church of his birth intensely, nonetheless said Catholic means here comes everybody. In that new context, we have to come to terms with a culture which now is truly global. And we have a role, I think precisely as Catholic believers, that is of extraordinary importance. And that will not reduce the tension between our Catholic faith and our American culture. Because for many people around the globe, globalization is a code word for Americanization. And if it's going to be something different than that, then we Americans have a particular obligation to create a culture here that is not uh, as destructive of the human spirit itself as the culture in which we now live, our own space-time continuum which is what we're exporting. In the synod, again, that Bishop Darcy spoke about, where bishops from all over the world, about 245 of us, came to talk about the vocation of bishop as minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the hope of the world. When bishops spoke about the world, the code word was always globalization. It came up again and again. It's the first time I've ever heard it used so insistently in a gathering of bishops, even an international gathering. And what came out of their sense was that globalization, while certainly a phenomenon that is out there and real, that it relates us all, creates its own space and time, creates therefore its own culture, nonetheless is very ambiguous. Some bishops spoke about globalization as a new opportunity because the global communications network, the electronic uh, nerve system, that puts us instantaneously in touch with everyone around the world is a new moment, a new place, a new Areopagus, as the Pope says, a new means for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's something good. It's also very good that this 
universal network of communications enables us to be far more sensitive to uh, uh, the um, situations where human rights are abused or are taken away. There are enormous communications uh, networks now that are able to address questions without ever getting people together. The very first universal movement of this sort that I saw was the campaign against landmines a couple of years ago. That there wasn't a single meeting held in any particular physical locus. It was all done through the internet and through electronic communication. And because of that, a treaty was born, which I think is a true um, benchmark in uh, the way in which we have to address the results of warfare. And if it can be done in regard to landmines, it can be done in regard to a lot of other things as well. It makes things like that possible, and that's very good. But more often than not, strangely, instead of being seen as a positive development, globalization was regarded as a very negative phenomenon by most bishops. Why? Because the communications network that make the sharing of ideas possible also make the transfer of capital extraordinarily, interest, uh, extraordinarily easy at the push of a button. Resources can be transferred. And when resources are transferred, then people have to follow. And so homes are disrupted, and we live in an age of immense forced immigration, whether for political or economic reasons. And the network of business relationships and of economic relationships that is carried by electronic globalization isn't something that is seen with great glee by a lot of people in countries who regard themselves as marginalized now in this new global economic order. Whether the economic analysis is fair or not, and there are a lot of questions about whether it is, and what in fact the economic benefits or difficulties of globalization might truly be. The popular sense that are moving into global space as economic agents is deleterious for many, many people in other parts of the world, and that we reap an unfair benefit from it gives birth to a lot of resentments against us. And the Pope always says that every economic system has to be judged by what it does to a human being, that we can't be cogs in an economic machine. And by those standards, we have to keep studying the new global economic order, even though it's very difficult to do so. And we can't simply allow that easy judgment that, well, all it does is increase poverty, which is the conviction of many, many bishops, and I'm sure of their people, without having studied it very carefully. And without uh, addressing it from a justice issue, if in fact it does that or where it does it. I'm convinced that it's a little more difficult to analyze than some of the analyses we heard in the Senate. But nonetheless, there is that. But even more profoundly than the economic problems of globalization are the cultural problems. If globalization means the exporting of American values, then uh, through this same electronic communication system, it also gives us TV shows, the family life of nations, very different from our own, is destroyed, as far as they can see it, and values that corrupt their own traditional way of life are exported, and they have nothing to say about it, and they are hugely resentful. So I think that what we have to face is that what we are exporting is a culture of desires, desires fomented, desires made visible, what John Paul II calls consumerism, and that we have created a kind of a corporate hegemony for many people at least, the way they see it, that in fact separates individuals into private worlds based on their desires and makes common goods inaccessible. To the extent that we have done that, and uh, you know, this is, has to be much more nuanced than what I'm saying, it is, after all, just an after-dinner speech. But to the extent that, that, that there is an element of truth in this kind of fear of globalization, we have, I think, as Americans, uh, our work cut out for us. And yet, in another way, we don't. No matter what we do, I think something else is going to happen. We're not an exception to the laws of history. We're not an exception as we might have imagined we were before September 11th. Perhaps the great irony is that the culture that we have largely created here and exported around the globe has, or will at least, destroy American civilization itself. If it does just extinguish the human spirit, then it will also extinguish our own. 
And uh, to the extent that that is a real threat to us, then the faith culture dialogue begun a generation ago prophetically with the Council is the most important conversation we can engage in today. The global order will not be America writ large. It, we will be subsumed as much as the Afghanis into something very different. How different it will be and what shape it will take is something that I think we can still do something about. For in the collapse of an old order, another always takes its place. There will be order. We resist anarchy. But And what will take its place will be global in some sense. But what specifically it will shape out to being is something that I think we have to give a lot of thought to and then a lot of energy toward. This conference is part of that conversation. The Holy Father says faith creates culture. Faith becomes culture. Our experience of who we are in Christ, if we work it out, will change us, our sense of space and time. It must. Because our faith tells us that our destiny is to transcend space and time, that our future is the same as that of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. He is our future. And he isn't bound by the physical continuum, the laws of space and time, in the same way that we are. That's why people had a hard time recognizing him after he rose from the dead. It was clearly him. The body isn't in the tomb. And yet it's not a body like yours or mine. Something has happened. Which says that our sense of space has to be very different from the sense of space of people who are not believers. For we, we entertain the idea of a future where space is very different, is changed completely, as is the sense of time. Our faith creates culture if we internalize it, if we take it in and don't allow it to be put aside in favor of other senses of what it means to be human. If we contemplate the risen Christ, then indeed we will become culture shapers in ways like nobody else can. How in this contemplation do we have access to Christ? We have access to him primarily through his actions on us in the liturgy of the church. Christopher Dawson, who was an enormously important analyst of culture, particularly culture shaped by the Catholic faith, pointed out a generation ago the pres preservation of her liturgical tradition was one of the main preoccupations of the church in the dark ages that followed the barbarian conquest since it was in this way that the vitality and continuity of the inner life of faith, which was the seed of a new order, were preserved. Celebrating the liturgy is extraordinarily important because each time the Mass is, ce is, is celebrated, the world changes much more than it changed on September 11th. What we do when we come together to celebrate the Eucharist has more impact on the globe than what the terrorists did on September 11th. If we believe that, then indeed we will see how the liturgy shapes our sense of time and of our uh, sense of being in an order that transcends the present uh, order in which we live now. Faith will shape culture also, not only to the extent that we contemplate the risen Christ, and not only that we have access to the actions of Christ, who sanctifies us in the liturgy, but also to the extent that we respond in faith to his actions in prayer. Our response, along with others in prayer, creates in the church a sense of communion, that I started talking about, because in prayer we have relationship to everyone whom Christ himself loves. Therefore, perhaps in some small way, although also in some very large way, I've come to appreciate more and more since September 11th how formative of culture is a little phrase we tell one another again and again, I'll pray for you. That says that in Christ we are related. And since we don't pray if we think Christ is a wimp, we pray because we think he has power and can change things then, in fact, we're engaged in a great enterprise when we pray for one another. It sounds very pedestrian, and I don't mean it at all to sound sentimental, but we're creating culture each time we promise verbally to pray for 
one another, and each time we come with each other's names before Christ and say, here are my brothers, here are my sisters. Some I know, some I don't. But here is the global order that is going to be different, if we're very lucky, from the order of injustice in various shapes that we've lived in so far. And if we're not lucky, then precisely because it is global, it will be a terrible, terrible place to live indeed. I'd like to close, because there won't be any other place to go, I'd like to close with a, a poem which was written on the 30th of September by a poetess who happens to be a member of the Archdiocesan Pastoral Council in Chicago. Shirley Valpo is her name. It's a wonderful advantage to have a poet in an Archdiocesan Pastoral Council. It really is truly marvelous. It's a dialogue between faith and culture. Someone who's extraordinarily sensitive to words and who enables us to see things that we wouldn't see otherwise. Even the mysteries of faith in ways that homilies don't always uh, enable us to express it. This was her reaction to the prayer service in Yankee Stadium on September 23rd. She wrote it a week later. She had been there. And here's how she writes. Into the place of bats and balls, where popcorn scent and cheering sound would saturate the air, into that place they sadly came and softly breathed. I hurt. Please pray for me. In silence profound, they seated their souls and planted their pain in the garden of prayer and softly breathed. I hurt. Please pray for me. The center mound arrayed as flag, the dusty path now blossom clad. Now came the others glad to share the day and carve the way to prayer, the gallant ones who wept for many in fear, who spoke for any to hear, who whispered within, You hurt, I'll pray for you. Then plaintive sound, both hope and pain, embraced the air as pipers breathe their bags to life and kissed the silence in the stands and seemed to play, You hurt, I'll pray for you. Now rabbi, Sikh, now Catholic, Greek, all raised their sound and held the souls of those in pain and said again, you hurt, I'll pray for you. By every name was God addressed, that every soul might come to rest, to hear his God so aptly blessed, to hear the message in his breast, You hurt, I'll stay for you. And then a tiny sound of joy. From somewhere in the massive stands, a quiet cheer or brief, breathless yes had loosed the chains of silence had blessed the rest with grace to be, had blessed the rest to live the day, had blessed the rest to gently say, We hurt, you prayed for us. Thank you. prelates at the podium uh, tonight, and uh, I have to give you some closing words. Um, I am in deep trouble here. I did uh, a, uh, a thread that's run through the three evening presentations, like this magnificent talk tonight by George Weigel, Alistair McIntyre, and Colonel George has been the importance of gift, of generosity, uh, of giving, and um, a lot of people have asked me how we, uh, how I managed to put together this uh, conference and its complexity, and of course the answer is I didn't put it together uh, at all. I uh, am uh, the uh, recipient of uh, wonderful gifts, and I'd like to say thank you to a few people for just a moment and then send you uh, on your way. First of all, to the staff of this magnificent uh, uh, CCE where, where they've kept us fed and uh, the temperature is controlled and the mic's working, Harriet Baldwin runs all this, to the many faculty members around the country, people like Joss Hope Shield and Becky DeYoung who brought buses and uh, vans of undergraduates uh, here, to our uh, to, to, to the invited speakers. Uh, uh, John, uh, 
Yeah, John Haldane's calumny against me was that I get these wonderful invited speakers by taking out big ads in Catholic magazines and then shaming the people into showing up. Uh, I only have one thing to say to John, and I'll make it brief, which he doesn't usually. Uh, John, it worked, okay? Actually, uh, I'm blessed with great friends in the world, and I exploited every one of them. We never talk about money when I invite people to come. After we feed all these hungry undergraduates, we divide up what's left and uh, pass, it, uh, uh, pass it around. Uh, I'm not going to invite any of the people we had back uh, for next year because they might say no, but I would uh, suggest they watch the uh, Catholic magazines about uh, March and see whether they'll be here uh, next year or not. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, my, my staff who really do do all of the work. Uh, uh, Margaret and uh, Darren were uh, insubordinate uh, tonight. There are only three kinds of people who work at the uh, Notre Dame Center for Ethics of Culture for, for, and Culture, whatever we're called. Those uh, whom we've never paid, uh, those that we paid for a while but don't pay anymore, and a few that we pay a little bit and they're about to slip into the second category, and some of them don't know that uh, yet. Um, James Kruger, uh, Aaron Potter, Darren Davis, Chris Toner, those are some of the people who uh, work for us, and most of them are not in that third category, I can assure you. Most of all, uh, Margaret Watkins Tate, who spoke up here before and said those insubordinate things. Uh, most, many of you who work at this conference know that uh, Margaret does all the work at the center. She does, not, does all our graphics work. We've had many questions about which New York graphics designers we have. Uh, Margaret does all of that. She edits all of our documents. She answers the mail when I answer mail, and those of you. She, uh, she does absolutely everything. And what you don't know is that she does that in her spare time. She's a, a brilliant young moral philosopher writing on Hume and Aristotle. And alas, I retarded her progress as long as I could, but her thesis will soon be finished and she'll be taking a job. Next year. So those of you who would like to work, we have young people in the audience for uh, Virtually nothing. Uh, we have uh, blueberry muffins almost every morning. Uh, Margaret's job uh, will be open. I, uh, seriously, it's. Uh, we hope someday to be a bit different kind of operation. And I ask your patience, those of you who sometimes didn't uh, get emails answered. Immediately working very hard. We have lots of projects, but I'd especially like to thank the graduate students. Uh, Darren Davis was there with Margaret. Drove up here. Spent the last two weeks. Took time. Uh, out of his life. Uh, he's at St. Louis University now. His father's very ill. Ask your prayers for his father. He drove up here and has been working nonstop for the last uh, two weeks and uh, alas, first category of worker for the Notre Dame Center for uh, Ethics and Culture. Thank you very much, Darren, for coming, for coming up here. Um, the um, Father Baxter, no friend of capitalism, accused me today of funding this conference by picking people's pockets. Now, those of you who know Baxter, since he doesn't, he, he, that was a compliment for him, since he prefers, he thinks theft in a capitalist society is to be preferred to honest toil. But uh, and I and I appreciate uh, I, I appreciate uh, Father Baxter's uh, comment. Actually, and we're taking. You know, pocket thing under consideration in the uh, Margaret's making a writing a memo on it right now. But we didn't do that, and I want to thank uh, one other person, especially George Mays. Uh, it's kind of a fancy sounding name on our brochures that this conference is funded by the Mays Excellence in Education Fund, uh, and that's what funds it. But it's actually a man named George Mays. I talked to him for 30 minutes, two and a half years ago, about what we want to do in this conference, and he uh, uh, he pulled out a checkbook and and has paid for all of this. He, uh, at the time, also said um, he didn't want to have long reports. He thought he, we were going to do the right thing, and he didn't have, he didn't want to listen to all that. Uh, I write him a letter every year and tell him what's happening. If you want to write him a letter and send it to me, I'll make sure he gets it. He uh, is a very, very generous man, and also, uh, those of you undergraduates who have eaten well, uh, you have George Mays uh, to thank. He wanted precisely for us to do what we're doing, and he would have approved of my sending that check to Gonzaga to bring Tom here uh, to, to, this, uh, to this conference. Um, there are other people to thank, and I'm, I'm sure I've forgotten them, and I 
and I apologize. Those of you who contributed papers, I'm sorry you only had 20 minutes. We had well over 100 uh, contributed papers this year, and we should have had a lot more on the program. We cut it to 70, and still we had lots of overlapping uh, sessions. Uh, a word about next year, and you get sent off. The conference next year is September 26th uh, to 28th. It will be on this campus. We've, we've outgrown this building, but I talked to Father Malloy, and he said he'd build us another one. So uh, <laughs> now whether, whether it's going to be done uh, by next year, well, the football team did win, and we, maybe that's, who knows? Who knows where we're headed? Um, our, our goal at, the, um, at these conferences is to change the face of ethics in the United States. I think the way applied ethics is being taught at most universities and colleges is very bad. It's bad for students. It corrupts the youth. Uh, and we need to change that. We need to write new textbooks. We need to bring together the kind of people we have at this conference and even more. And we plan to have summer institutes in the future, lots of visiting fellowships, postdocs. Uh, we want, we're very ambitious, and there are lots of people who are prepared uh, to help us with, with this. Our target right now, and the reason we wanted so many undergraduates to, to be here, is we need to uh, create intellectuals who can fight the battles. The, the real battle, of course, for the culture of life goes on with people like Margaret Garvey, who's here tonight, who goes out and works with the most disabled uh, people in our society, lots of people like that. Those, the, those of us who aren't that good, we write books and articles and give talks. But our battle is important too. Uh, I talked to an undergraduate after Alistair McIntyre's magnificent talk last night, and she said, what I want to know is how to be like Alistair McIntyre. Now, I, I did tell her to give that up. I tried that. I was very unhappy for 10 years uh, after I first got to know Alistair uh, trying that, and, and I got over it, and I told her to get over it. Uh, the 20 years since, uh, I've been a much, much happier person. But uh, the, um, to get to Carnegie Hall, you practice. Uh, to get involved in this intellectual fight, uh, you study. You have to read John Rawls' prose. you got to do all those uh, things, and I hope we... Uh, some of you are encouraged uh, to do those uh, to do those things. The, uh, I was talking to Cardinal George earlier. I don't know how many of you read Ronald Green's ethics report on the cloning incident last week, but we have an instance of, I think, sort of a prime instance of the kind of bad ethics we have to overcome. Ronald Green, a very distinguished academic, argued that human embryos created by cloning are so different from anything we've ever had in the past. We have to consider them something new in nature, and he proposed what seems to me the chilling, chilling name, activated eggs. Uh, it would be easier with that name to do what we know we shouldn't do. There's, there's, a, lot of work to be, uh, there's a lot of work to be done here, and uh, the undergraduates who are in this room are among the people who will be doing it, and the graduate students and people who have come to this conference. Uh, Next year, September 26th to 28th, we will convene here again. Watch those magazines to see who will uh, be here. The fire marshal told us we can't get any bigger. Seriously, we, we're, we're at max down here, but we'll figure out some way because I have a feeling there will be more people who want to, uh, uh, who want to come. Uh, I would like to very practical details at the end. If we don't have your email address, we'd like to send out some more information and keep you up to date on some of the things we did here. Please just drop us an email. You can find our email address all over all this propaganda you've seen. Drop us your email address so we can uh, find you. We'll be in touch. Many people have asked about our publication plans for uh, papers. Things are complicated. You will have noticed that we have some, uh, we've had some video cameras around. We have videos of some of these uh, talks which we will uh, be making uh, available. I would like to post some of the papers delivered here on our website right away. If you would like your paper to be posted right away, send it to us and we will, we will get it up. Um, we'd like to build a community of people uh, dedicated to certain ideals and these two conferences we've had are the beginning of that. Next year it's from death to life agendas for reform. We'd like to do things slightly more, we'd like to discuss slightly more concrete uh, matters, but uh, you send us something along and we'll see if we can fit it into the program. Thank you again, finally, all of you for uh, coming. It seems to me it's been a uh, stimulating uh, weekend and uh, Notre Dame has been happy to have all of you.
Thank you, and thank you again, Cardinal George. Good night.